does that. You know, there's obviously a sickness in the society that has to be dealt with. So what will work? How do we heal South Africa? South Africa has among the highest stats in the world around GBB and violence against women. A society where violence has become normalized. crime, the brutality with which that crime is perpetrated is just mind-boggling. And it's not... We're opposing bail because it was a senseless crime. This, there was no reason for Megan to have been killed the way that she was. And, you know, we're opposing bail, but we're standing here today for all of our fallen angels as well. I think women are tired of being quiet and we're tired of feeling unsafe in our own beautiful country. We as women need to train our boy child how to love the next person. We as mothers need to stand up and do this more often. It only hits home when it's near to us. We need to stand up and say, we take a stand. Hi everyone, welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me here again today. Last week we spoke about the hockey stick killer and how road rage was taken to a whole nother level with that man. But today we're going to speak about a case that is also equally horrific but just so incredibly unnecessary. And like we always say on this channel, all the crimes we have spoken about are unnecessary. But you will see exactly what I mean once we get into this case. But today we are talking about a case that is absolutely mind-boggling and nonsensical to say the least. And being in South Africa, I am sure we all know of someone who has experienced some type of crime, be it being mugged, being robbed in their house, having their house robbed while they were away, carjacking, anything like that. Crime, robbery and motives are definitely not new to us on this channel. But this case and so many other cases that we have spoken about on this channel are linked to gender-based. And when I showed you one of those clips in last week's video, if you haven't seen that, I'll link it up here. It was a video where one man was sitting in his car and he was apologizing to the other man for doing something. And then the other man just walked over to him and slapped him in the face. And I think in South Africa, we have this precedence of just violence or aggression. For example, let me just defend my points here. Is that last week I was driving in an area that I used to stay in as a kid. And I decided to go down one of the roads and to go and see the house that I grew up in. So I was sitting outside the house and I'm just looking at the house and how much it has changed. And it brought back a lot of feelings of like nostalgia and happy fluffiness. And I kid you not, it was ruined when I was sitting in my car, right? And right next to me walks the school kid because at the end of the road that I grew up, there was a school. So behind me comes the school kid in his uniform and he walks maybe two to three meters in front of my car. Now I'm parked on the side of the road. I don't think that the kid noticed me, but the kid stops two to three meters in front of my car and two men then come up and approach this kid with a knife and take his cell phone away from him. And now the kid is trying to kind of defend himself, but he knows he's against two grown men with a knife pointed at him and he hands over the cell phone to these men and they're having some verbal altercation. I don't really remember much of what I did. I think I was just sitting still, but then the two men looked at me and this kid also looked at me. And when the men and the child looked at me, there were two things that went through my mind. One was extreme panic and two was I kind of wanted to take my car and just ram it into these men who just hurt this kid. And I think it was that reaction with violence that is so ingrained into us. But I didn't. I didn't take my car and ram it into the people because the kid was in the way. But when these two men looked at me, I thought in my head, here we go. Something's going to happen. My window's wide open. I'm never going to get this window up before these two men get to my car. 
but I don't know who was looking after me that day because as these two men turned, it kind of all happened at the same time. This man in this massive bucky or SUV came riding down the road and the two men then ran away and the kid was then standing two to three meters in front of me looking completely dumbfounded. And just as a side note, yes, I did take the kid to the police station and his parents came and everything. So he was fine, obviously mentally scarred. When we were at this police station and he was explaining what was happening, he was obviously very shaken up, but with a sense of familiarity. It's almost like he wasn't surprised by what he had experienced. And also when I noticed this kind of look on his face and thinking about today's case, I realized that yes, I was shocked at what happened, but it's not uncommon for that to happen here in South Africa. And with that long-winded intro, that is basically what we are going to talk about today. My point being is that in South Africa, being a woman, we know that there are statistics and there are facts that anything can happen to any one of us within a blink of an eye. And I wanted to mention the young schoolboy because violence can happen to any one of us, be it men, women or children here in South Africa and anywhere else in the world. But this case that we're going to talk about brings upon such feelings of helplessness as well as a kind of lack of understanding to why people are so mean to people. And last one from me before we get into this case, everyone in this case is presumed innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. So just a side note before we get into this case. And with all that being said and all that information thrown at you, let's get into today's case. Intended for mature audiences only. For today, we are in an area called Philippi in Cape Town, which can be seen as quite a rural area with some farm areas in it as well. Megan Creamer was described by a lot of people and her close friends as the sweetest of souls, kind, caring, and incredibly compassionate. She was a friend, a businesswoman, and was an avid animal lover. Megan would always stand up for animals being mistreated or unloved, and her friends would also say that she had a very quick, dry sense of humor. Megan had one older brother named Jeremy, and Megan and her brother grew up in Neisner, and Megan and her brother also went to a school in Neisner until they then matriculated in 2007. After school, Megan then went on to Rhodes University, where she then graduated with a master's degree, and her master's degree was in microbiology. And Megan's intention by getting this degree was to try and find a cure for animal sicknesses, particularly with horses, because horses were really her passion. After graduating, Megan then moved to Cape Town, where she then worked as a manager in her brother's bakery. While she was busy working in the bakery and while she was looking after a lot of animals in her private time, she also started her own business where she would try and make show ribbons and other accessories for horse riding competitions. Horses were really Megan's life and Megan started riding when she was nine years old. She once took top honors in the Southern Cape Championships and continued to compete as an adult. But because of her love of animals, like I said, she moved from Neisner to Cape Town and when in Cape Town, she then lived on a farm in an area called Philippi. Megan then stayed on a stud farm, but she didn't stay in the main house on the stud farm. She stayed in like a granny flat or a little cottage on the edge of the farm and the owners who she paid rent to stayed then in the main house. While Megan was staying on this farm, she kept her horse named Sir Blue. And just before this entire incident happened with Megan, she rescued a very sick puppy and was trying to nurse him back to health. This incident all took place on the 3rd of August, 2019. And apparently while Megan may have been in her cottage, Megan Creamer was last seen leaving her cottage around half past six on Saturday, the 3rd of August, 2019. Now in August in South Africa, it is winter. It is the dead of winter. So it gets dark very quickly. And I'm sure by half past six, it would have been dark outside or at least dusk. But later on when Megan's friends would hear that she had apparently left the house after half past six and while it was dark, they were not quite sure why and how this could have occurred because Megan hated going out in the dark. She hated going out alone at night. Her friends would also say that she wasn't really a night owl and that she preferred to spend her evenings alone at home. And apparently before Megan even left the property, she was then on the phone with one of her friends and she was talking about how she was getting into bed with her new little puppy and they were snuggling. And she was talking about how she was getting ready, putting on her PJs. So it didn't really make sense that all of a sudden she would then leave the house. And some people did say that they tried to contact Megan on Sunday evening, but there was no response from Megan. 
And when Megan Creamer didn't show up for work on Monday morning, everyone knew that something was 100% wrong. Her mom then alerted police that Megan Creamer was missing. And before police could even get to the stud farm to start looking, her friends and family were all about the stud farm and looking everywhere where they could find clues about where Megan could have gone. Police did arrive, they searched the house, they searched the surrounding area, but nothing was found. But when they looked at the CCTV footage, they did see that someone driving Megan's car did leave the property and it was only one person within this vehicle. So minutes turned into hours and hours turned into days. And four days after she was first reported missing, Megan's white Toyota Aris that she had left the property with was found. And it was found in a roadblock happening in Weinberg. The car was reported stolen previously and inside the white Toyota Aris was three men. Now remember I said earlier that the police looked at the CCTV footage on the outskirts of the property and they saw that Megan's car had left the property and it was only one person in the car. So the question is, what really happened to Megan? Why were there now three men in her car? Did she maybe need something and that's why she left the property at night even though she had just texted friends that she was getting ready to settle in bed? So let's talk about the three men that were found in Megan's vehicle. Number one was a man named Jeremy Sears and he was a farm worker who grew up and worked on the stud farm that Megan also lived on. Friends and co-workers said that he was very polite and also a very hard worker. When police did a search on Jeremy Sears, they found that he had previous charges on assault and car theft. The two other men inside the vehicle was named Shiraz Jafter and Charles Daniels. Charles Daniels had previous charges of theft and drug possession and Shiraz Jafter had previous charges of murder. And these were all the three men that were inside of Megan's car. So basically these police caught these three men red-handed for car theft. Because remember, no one knew what happened to Megan. She was not in the vehicle. The vehicle was just reported stolen. So they really had nothing to go on besides these three men had possibly stolen Megan's car. But sadly, one day after the three men were found inside the white Toyota Aris, this car theft investigation was sadly turning into a murder investigation. On the fifth day that Megan was reported missing, police pulled all the men individually into the interrogation room. But these men decided to say nothing. The Police really tried. They constantly were asking them about what happened that night. Why were you in Megan's vehicle? It is very suspicious that you were in Megan's vehicle. But eventually one of the men cracked and one of them were unnamed. So I'm not quite sure which one of the three men spoke out. But one of them cracked and they then said they know where Megan's body is. So this one man then led police to the area where Megan Creamer's body was found. Megan Creamer was found on a sand mine near a Philippi farm, only one kilometer from where she lived. Megan had been beaten and strangled. She had her hands and feet bound. And also what they had used to strangle her was a blue ribbon from which police assumed was one of the products remember that Megan was making. Because she owned a business in blue ribbons for show horses, it was possible that they grabbed anything on hand and one of these ribbons was what they grabbed and what they strangled Megan to death with, apparently. It was unclear whether Megan had been sexually assaulted or not. Her body had seemed not to be fresh and it seemed to have been lying there for a couple of days already. The three men, Jeremy Sears, who was 27 at the time, Charles Daniels, who was 39 at the time, and Shiraz Jafter, who was 34 at the time, were all taken to the court to have their bail hearings read. When the community knew about the hearing, the court was packed with women of all races and all backgrounds to make sure that these men didn't get their bail hearings. In the end, the three men then decided to cancel their bail applications and all three of them were then charged with murder and had to wait in the jail cells until their trial. While all of this was going down, a beautiful memorial service was held for Megan Creamer and so many people turned up in support. At Megan's wake, people spoke about her four passions, which were horses, ice cream, her nephew, and Christmas. Her close friend quoted from Harry Potter, as Megan was also a massive fan of Harry Potter, and she said, quote, happiness can be found even in the darkest of places, if one only remembers to turn on the lights. 
Ice creams, which remember was one of Megan's passions, was handed out during the service. Eventually, after a couple of months, the three men then arrived at Athlone Magistrates Court to begin their trial. Sadly, at the trial, some information came out about what may have happened to Megan Creamer that night, but we still do not know the full extent of what happened on the 3rd of August 2019. So far, what we know is that Megan was abducted outside her house, possibly because her dog was found outside and her puppy was never left outside alone, but this is all just based on speculation because we do not know the full story yet. Then, all three of the men and Megan got into Megan's vehicle, and at one point then drove to another area away from Philippi. It is assumed that they drove towards the Weinberg area, because apparently Megan's car was also stopped in Weinberg on the 3rd of August that night at another roadblock. And the traffic services said, quote, The driver of the vehicle was not deemed to be under the influence and was let go. End quote. So, if the traffic services had maybe got an inkling of someone being under the influence or anything horrible that may have been happening, someone could have checked the boot of the car or just looked inside the car and Megan could possibly still be alive today. But wherever Megan had ended up or wherever these guys ended up, the suspects apparently beat Megan so badly that they broke her nose in order to get her ATM pin out of her. For the next two days after Megan had gone missing, three different cash withdrawals had taken place. The total amount of cash withdrawn was not really revealed, but apparently according to a reliable source on one of the articles that I read, that it could have been in the tens of thousands of rands. And during the time that this whole incident occurred, Shiraz Jafta was actually on bail for murder at the time that he was apparently in the vehicle with the other two men. Apparently, the three men are believed to be members of the Six Bobs gang. And according to a private security source, Jeremy Sears is alleged to have told police that he murdered Megan in her cottage and then removed her body in the white Toyota Aurus parked around 30 meters away from her cottage. But this has been ruled out because Jeremy Sears was actually seen on the stable footage leaving the farm at around 5 p.m. that evening. Also on that evening, the stables were absolutely live with activity. There were a lot of jockeys there and show jumpers and grooms, so they were all busy there with the horses. And so any activity in Megan's house would possibly have been heard or seen because she stayed very close to the stables and when police were there there was also no sign of a struggle. So just how, when and what happened to Megan and how she was abducted still remains a mystery. The next CCTV footage sighting after Megan had left in her Toyota outside the farm was at around 7.02 p.m. and that was at a garage at Strunfontaine Road. Then at around half past 11 the same night, her car was then picked up at this roadblock. It also emerged that withdrawals from Megan's bank account were made from Megan's account at Pick and Pay Archery and at Pelican Park ShopRite. And one of the final withdrawals from Megan's account was at a Philippi ATM at around quarter to seven on August the 5th. Police do think that there is a possibility that there was a fourth person involved because the three men were already in custody at this point. But like I said, everyone is innocent until proven guilty and this case is still ongoing. The suspects have reportedly asked for new lawyers and delayed the case and also there have been so many new set dates that have been thrown out and postponed because witnesses have failed to appear in court. So an absolute tragedy. I think that this is very, very sad and very, very frustrating that this case can't go on because there are possible suspects sitting right there. But like I said, everyone's innocent until proven guilty. But I couldn't find any sentencing for the three men, so I assume the case is still ongoing. But if I'm wrong, you're more than welcome to let me know in the comments below. So what do you think happened to Megan Creamer? After everything that happened to Megan, her brother Jeremy did sell his bakery in Cape Town and he moved to Pretoria with his wife and his son, which was Megan's nephew. But let me know what you think of this case down below. But if and when we hear any updates on this case, I will let you know and we'll do an updated video. But let me know what you think happened down below and if one of the suspects was seen leaving the property before anything apparently happened to Megan, maybe, just speculation, he could have maybe been a lookout and let the rest of the guys know when Megan was alone and everything was quiet and then everything happened. But we won't know what happened and we won't know the full story until the trial is concluded. But on that note, I hope everyone is staying safe. Thank you for watching this video. 
and I hope that everyone has a lovely day further. Let me know what you think of this case down below and if you think that the suspects are guilty or not. And if you think that there's a fourth man involved or fourth person involved in this case. But that's all from me. Have a good day. See you next week. Bye.